Soviet tanks have been in the news a lot recently, and I honestly can't imagine why, but it'd be an understatement to say that people don't think very highly of them. Some people think the criticism isn't fair, while others say they're just outdated. Frankly, I agree with the latter, but some people don't realize just how old these designs are. They'll say, oh, these are 80s tanks or 70s tanks. It goes a bit further back than that. It might be hard to believe, but the T-64, which was the basis for all Soviet MBTs, actually started development in the 50s. The T-64 is still being used to this day, and common opinion on it is pretty mixed. Some people think it was revolutionary, others think it was absolute junk. So let's take a look at its history. The T-64 is the brainchild of Alexander Morozov, a Soviet tank design legend. After the designer of the T-34 died of pneumonia, which he contracted while testing the T-34, Morozov's team was responsible for refining it, making it into a viable combat vehicle. They were pretty successful in this. As while the T-34 was not well liked initially, it was a pretty effective tool later on. Morozov also designed the T-54, a revolutionary design in its own right. The T-54 emphasized low weight without reducing armor effectiveness, and for his next big tank project, Morozov wanted to continue this trend. It would be known as the NST, or New Medium Tank. He actually had the idea in the late 40s, but work wouldn't begin in earnest until May 1952. Later on down the road, it'd be given the designation Object 430. It would use the new 100mm D-54, a purpose-built high-performance tank gun. It would also be roughly the same size as the T-54, but would have better armor and mobility. As you can probably guess, trying to increase firepower, armor, and mobility while staying small is pretty difficult. So Morozov reached out to engineers. He wanted all the latest tech. The design would include novel technology such as a dual-axis stabilizer, coincidence rangefinder, automatic loader, and composite armor. In the case of the armor, this is something the US was already experimenting with. On the experimental T-95 medium tank, they had installed silicus cord armor, so essentially glass panels between steel plates. It did work pretty well, being very effective at stopping shaped charges. Even for kinetic threats, it was about as good as RHA. They would even planned to install it on the M60, but there were a few issues that stopped this. First, due to how brittle the armor was, it was really bad at taking multiple hits. Second, only two places in the US can manufacture it. For the first issue, Soviet engineers fixed this by introducing plastics into the mix, effectively making fiberglass. This made it much better at sustaining multiple hits. For the turret armor, ceramic balls would also be used. To reduce the size of the engine compartment, it would use an opposed piston diesel engine. Originally, this was going to be the 4TPD, which produced just 480 horsepower, but this was replaced by the 5TD. The 5TD produced 580 horsepower. Later on down the road, it would produce 700. Much like the Apes or Ace engine, which I talked about in my CATTB and Abrams X videos respectively, the 5TD had high thermal efficiency. It also used a unique cooling system, which drew cool air through the radiators. This eliminated the need for cooling fans. The suspension wasn't all that special. It used a new lightweight torsion bar system, with relatively small road wheels. If you have trouble identifying Soviet MBTs, the road wheels are a good place to look. In comparison to the T-72 and T-80, the T-64's road wheels are tiny. This can be seen on the automotive testbed, which was based on a spare OT-54 flamethrower tank. Morozov proposed his new tank idea to the Soviet government, who eventually accepted it, although with some hesitation. Morozov's design did seem promising, but they had two main concerns, the maturity of the engine and the reliability of the autoloader. As it would turn out, these concerns were well-founded. In early 1959, a few prototypes underwent trials. To say they did not perform well would be putting it mildly, Mostly thanks to the engine. The engine was simply nowhere near acceptable, and would take a lot of time to fix. That wasn't the only delay though. The gun that was originally specified, the D-54, would have to be replaced. The D-54 was rifled, which was a bit of a problem. It was believed that unlike smoothbore guns, it couldn't utilize APFSDS. Armor piercing fin stabilized discarding Sabo. The D-54 probably could have used APFSDS, but it'd be a bit more difficult to make it work. So it was decided that, instead, it would use the U5TS, a smoothbore 115mm. This gun would also be used by T-62. With a new gun, the NST was rebranded to Object 432. The U5TS was just a stopgap, though. In 1962, development of a smoothbore 125mm began. When this gun was eventually installed, it was called Object 434. There was one issue with the U5TS. It used single-piece casings, which in the small turret of the Object 432 was basically impossible to handle. Eventually, two-piece casings were made. Another issue was found with the turret armor. During the casting process, the ceramic balls would deviate from their intended position. To fix this, the balls were replaced with aluminum. Performance wasn't as good, but it was a bit lighter, and it was actually possible to make in a scale. Unfortunately, this solution had its own issues. On a non-penetrating hit to the turret, the armor would form voids, making it much less effective for the next hit. And thanks to Khrushchev, who was Premier at that time, there were even more delays. He had a personal bias towards missile-armed tanks. 
so we encouraged that a few be developed from the NST. A few prototypes were made, but no such vehicles actually went into service. It did accomplish one thing though, distracting Morozov's team. Funnily enough, the T-64 would eventually fire ATGMs, just from its gun, and without needing a specialized vehicle. If you're wondering why you would use a gun-launched ATGM, as opposed to, say, APFSDS, it was to outrange NATO tank destroyers. Missiles have much greater effective range. In 1964, troops received a few early Object 432s. Again, things did not go well. The engine continued to be a serious problem. It was not only unreliable thanks to the air filtration system, it was also very difficult to start in cold weather, which if you're a tank operating in Russia, or areas close to Russia, that's a pretty big issue. The suspension was also arguably too lightweight, as it was found to have trouble coping with the vehicle's weight. And to put the cherry on top, the autoloader was also extremely unreliable, with some sources claiming it only worked around 60% of the time. It was a carousel autoloader. It held 30 rounds in the T-64, 28 in the T-64A. The vehicle had 37 rounds in total. Aside from the reliability, a carousel also still propellant vertically, which increased the chance of ammunition explosion. The average fire rate was around 8 RPM, or one shot every 7 seconds. If the autoloader broke down, rounds could be loaded manually, but it took quite some time. And those were just the technical issues. Compared to conventional tanks, such as the T-62, it took four times as long to build, and cost over double. On the crew side of things, it was quite a shake up there too. It was much more complex than conventional tanks, requiring much more training. Some crews compared it to operating an aircraft. I don't know if that comparison is quite accurate, but it was a very sophisticated machine. And as you can guess, having an automatic loader, crew size was reduced, now being composed of just three, the driver, commander, and gunner. Crews were not overly fond of this new arrangement, as it increased their effective workload. By this point in the program, the Soviet government was incredibly frustrated. Other tank plants saw this, and decided to take advantage of it. They didn't want to produce the T-64, they wanted to produce their own designs, maintaining their influence. It's honestly crazy how factionalized the Soviet tank industry was, and it continues to this day. On the internet, there are some people who hate the T-64 just because it was made in Kharkiv. Anyway, back to the point. These tank plants proposed their own variations of Object 432. These would eventually lead to the T-72 and T-80. The T-72 was a simplified version, using a diesel engine and T-62B components. The T-80 was basically just a T-64, but with a gas turbine. Object 432 went into service as T-64, while Object 434 was T-64A. Despite technically entering service in the 60s, they weren't considered acceptable for use until the 1970s. By this point, the T-64 was generally a very solid and advanced vehicle. It was very expensive, and definitely still had some quirks, but its fire control system was much better than the T-72s. The T-80 had better mobility, but it also had worse range, and was surprisingly even more expensive. In 1976, the T-64B was introduced. This offered improved armor, a more advanced fire control system, an improved suspension system, and the ability to fire gun-launched ATGMs. The fire control system had a laser rangefinder, solid-state computer, the gun and sight stabilized in both axes, and computed sight lead. It's estimated that 12,000 T-64s were produced. It continues to be used and upgraded to this day, mostly by Ukraine. It reminds me a lot of the T-14 Armada. It was an advanced concept that was forced into service too early, so it floundered and suffered delay after delay, and was eventually sidelined for more efficient options. Obviously, the T-14 is much worse. The T-64 is undeniably advanced, and a huge game-changer. But if the Cold War had gone hot, I don't think it would have been as big of a menace as people think. Anyway, that's pretty much all I got to say. If you guys have suggestions for video topics, leave them in the comments. I hope this video was somewhat informative, and I'll see you on the next one.